worship you. I worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, wow, what an awesome, awesome presence we feel here. Let's worship him some more. Let's just give him glory and honor for a lot of it. Lord, I love you. I praise you. Lord, from the depths of our souls, we thank you, Lord, for the grave. We thank you, Lord, for your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done. But through your victory, Lord God, we have victory. Through your victory, Lord, we have victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 What an awesome day it is. Easter 2020. It's, oh, wow. It's just awesome. Amen. Some of you don't know how to respond. It's like, yeah, it's okay. However, amen. Easter 2020. You were thinking you was going to die last year. No, it's not 2020, by the way. It's 2021. Woo! That's even better. I'm not losing my mind. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Such an awesome privilege to be here. I'm so thankful for all of you, all of our guests, those of you that have traveled. I talked to a couple people here that have traveled from out of state. Very thankful that you're here. A few of you, of course, I say out of state, foreign country, some of you, California. It's like, mm. anyway, I'm playing. I'm being funny. We love Californians that love Texas and our guns and our guts and our God. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Get an amen. <laughs> okay. It is so good to have all of you here. I'm so thankful for these guys. They have... This guy, man, I don't even know how to say that. We're the, the Votal. He's, he's the bomb. Yeah. Thankful. He dropped his microphone. No, no, not his microphone. His, these things that they put in their ears, it helps them to where they can hear their tone. In ears, it helps them to where they hear their tone. His come out. And then the pack fell off. It's like, and he just kept on singing. I'm like, man, he's incredible. Better than me. I'd be up here going, where's my Bible? No. Let's pray. So, <laughs> pray, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Amen. God is so good. You look beautiful. I, I've looked at our children, and uh, I'm just dumbfounded at how gorgeous these children are. You have got some beautiful, beautiful children. And those that have children, those of you that don't, you're going to have children one day, too. But, and they're going to be pretty, but these that are here are awesome. And uh, it is just a, and they're so proud. I had one young man tell me that he was ready. To, he was disappointed. He walked into church upset. He thought they were going to have the Easter egg hunt first. So, I, and then another young man, I told him a while ago, I'll take my time, preach really long. We'll eat Easter eggs. And Sister Hilly was over there going, no, don't tell him. No, 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 no. Pray. Don't, it won't be long. Amen. God bless y'all. God bless all these guys. Appreciate all of them. Mr. Caitlin did awesome. My wife did awesome. Amen. So, um, tell you what, let's do this. I'm, I'm just, I'm not typical. So those of you that are looking and waiting on typical, I'm not him. Let's ask God before we ever hear the word. Let's just do this. I'm, I'm not, but we're all spiritual beings. And I'll talk to us a little bit more on that level in a minute. But we're all spiritual beings. And we, all, we all know we need God. And how much of God we want, it's up to us. But let's ask God to minister to us today. Lord, we give you glory and honor. Um, you see us you know who we really are you know our strengths, our weaknesses the things that we struggle with I want you to minister to us today minister to me, minister through me Lord God minister to every individual in this building Lord God, let us be moved by your word to change, to follow you to do your work and your will I give you glory and honor in the name of Jesus we pray and everybody say in Jesus name Amen, there's no name like Jesus Amen Amen. Let's have a seat. God bless you. Amen. So I'm, I'm going to do a quick survey. I know this is not in my notes. They're probably going, oh, Lord, he's already off. I just started off off. Started off off. That's pretty funny. But anyway, um, how many here have a, a done something? I'm, now, I'm going to immediately refer to marriage because my wife is here. How many here have ever done something and had that, um, that realization that it was, it was a lot better than you expected? like oh yeah I thought having getting married I'm like oh this is gonna be fun it was better than I expected then I had a couple of kids that's got it actually ended up better than I expected <laughs> then I had a third one 
And it's a lot better than I expected. So, hey, I mean, I have all three of them. They're all three. Never mind. I won't say anyway. So we're going to go to John chapter 2, or John chapter 20. And um, as you know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can stand or you can sit. It's, uh, we respect the Word of God. That's why we stand. We stand based on, uh, number one, a reverence and a respect for the Lord, Word of God. And then number two, it was exemplified to us in the Old Testament and, so, and, and even in the New Testament. So we've got to, that's what we do. So John 20, and we're going to read 10 verses. I'll read them fast. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. There is a lot to that right there. But anyway, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And you don't know this. It doesn't say it in here, but it's John. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out of the tomb, out for the tomb, excuse me. They were both running, but the other disciple outran John. And reached the tomb first. That would, I would be, I'd be, I'd, I mean, outran Peter. I'm getting it all mixed up. I'm sorry. I'd be that John dude. I'm like, I'm like a singer soul machine. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, until that moment, there's moments, they're just moments, until that moment they still hadn't understood the scripture that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. That's why I will stop right there. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, at the entrance to, okay, my, like I said earlier in the, in the first part of the service, my wife and I were blessed to go to Israel back five, four years ago. And at the entrance to Jerusalem's Church of All Nations, there is a sign, which is the church sits here and the Garden of Gethsemane is over here to the left. So if you can imagine that and the old, the old olive trees, they're like massive and they're, they're like literally like two and three thousand year old years old and at the entrance to that church there's a sign that warns everyone no expl ex I am struggling no explanations inside the church no explanations inside the church obviously it's there to discourage talkative tour guides or or visitors from disturbing the ambiance of the people that are there praying they're really truly praying. There's people in there. It's a church. And so they don't want a lot of people in there shouting about what happened here and what happened there. And so it's an obvious reference or reference to the fact that all that come to that place already know what happened. If not for that knowledge of the Garden of Gethsemane, that church being there wouldn't matter. Nobody would visit it. But you obviously know something or you wouldn't even, and, and, and I, of course being there, there's people from every area, every corner of the globe. It's right on, but we call corners. <laughs> every area of the world, there are people that come to the Garden of Gethsemane. They come because they have a certain knowledge about what significant thing happened there. In this room today, I doubt if there's any over the age of eight years old, ten years old, somewhere in there that have no knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I am not here to convince you that Jesus died and rose from the dead on the third day. And that resurrection was for our benefit, but I do want to carry it a little farther. I believe with everything inside of me, there may be the simplest and the youngest among us might believe that Easter is about the bunny laying colored eggs, but I'm pretty sure that's not even true itself. But while, <laughs> while, while you may be no theologian, and we all spend our time in secular pursuits. You are here on Easter Sunday of 2021 because you know the significance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the most important event that has ever taken place. Period. I said it is the most important event that has ever taken place in all of history, it's, it's the pinnacle. 
It's the place. It's the climax. And church, we have been given the opportunity, the knowledge, the understanding of the importance of that one event. But some of us do not understand how it affects us. We put it in some uh, a chronological event in the past. But Easter is not about the past. Easter is not about one event that took place by Jesus Christ. Easter is about the opportunity given to every one of us to be born again of the water and the spirit and to live a new life to overcome the things of this world and to be what God wants us to be. Hallelujah. In this world, in this world, and I, I honestly hate to reference this part of the message, but I need to. In this world, the dead stay dead. We are limited in even slowing down that process. And death is often, most often, the cruelest punishment for living well. It is those that live well that we miss the most. We do not miss those that passed and made no impact or made a bad impact. We miss those that made the greatest impact. And we have found is in this many times in our lives, none of us are immune to that. None of the adults are. Death is a cruel reminder of our short span of time on this earth. It is a reminder of our humanity, our flesh, our weakness. We have been reminded of death many times. In the recent past, we, we lost a very dear loved one. But Easter, Easter, yeah. hey, Resurrection Sunday, Easter reminds us that there is life after this life. There is life after death. There is something more beyond this world, and we just got to get our mind right with God. He's looking for people that would follow him, do his will and work, to set your mind on the things of eternity because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. True Christians, and I, I use that word often, but I want to be very clear about this. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how deep I can go. But people that say, I believe in God are not Christians and I'm not trying to be rude I believe I've got a car outside I think I do I have when I looked out the door earlier I believe it was there last time I looked it's not whether I believe there is a God but is do I obey the Word of God do I put the Word of God in my mind in my heart do I live after the will of God am I a true follower of Christ do you live for the Lord. In, in my life, all of my life, I've heard uh, we need to live for God. I'm sure most of you have heard that. You need to live for God. You don't hear it out in the world, but you hear it in the church all the time. Are you living for God? Do you live for God? I'm living for God. I'm a God. I'm, yeah, I follow the Lord. What does it mean to live for God? What does it mean to, to, to be a Christ follower? What does it mean to, to live a life that pleases Him? To live a life we live with knowledge of life. It is, it is something that, that we uh, can't uh, escape. We live in knowledge of death. We, we live with that in our mind. But, but church, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was, as John chapter 1 tells us, he was uh, manifest from heaven. God in the flesh manifest on earth. So that we could see him. So that he could pay the ultimate price. Pay the price, the sacrifice. So that we might look to Jesus. The only hope. The Bible says in Acts 4 and 12. There's no other name under heaven. Given among men whereby we must be saved. We have one hope. And that door, that, that hope is the door. Jesus Christ. And if we don't understand this. And if we miss this. We are missing something that is greater than anything else in our lives. Yes, the, the pinnacle of history, the, the, the time, the dates of life, even, even B.C. and A.D., they all hinge upon that moment. But what your life hinges on is not that moment, but your choice. Your choice. The death of Jesus Christ was extremely cruel, but it had a purpose. It started, of course, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a quick analogy or, or a quick uh, narrative of what happened. You, you probably know as much as I do. It started with mockery and doubt. They brought him before the 
counsel just to mock him and to doubt him. They spat upon his face. They falsely accused him. They slapped him. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they, they laid him upon a cross. And I have seen, I have literally held the nails that the Romans used. And I've, I've, I've literally held a nail that they said this was used uh, in a crucifixion. And, and it, it, is not, it doesn't look so pretty. It doesn't look so sharp. You would think, oh, they're going to get a grinder after it. Make it where it doesn't hurt. No, they didn't care. They drove those nails into the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. They mocked him more. They, they thrust a spear in his side. And they stood before him and made fun and doubted, on him, doubted in his ability. All of these things were done not just to fulfill prophecy, though that is part of it. They were done not to just prove his uh, identity as God manifest in the flesh, but that is part of it too. They were done not just to give his spirit to his followers, that, though that was part of it. But it was better than that. It was better than what those apostles and those disciples expected. It was better than what we expect most of the time. Because when he gave us his spirit, he gave us the opportunity, the open door for a new life. For a life that did not struggle with the things that we struggled with in the past. For a life that held promise of a better future. For a life that stood before us as a door waiting for us to enter in. Hallelujah. It's all, it's all of these things are so much better than we expect. It was better than the apostles expected. I read in John chapter 20, and it's, it's very interesting the way uh, you, you don't understand sometimes what they're going through. And in fact, I, I preached a few weeks ago uh, after the crucifixion. Peter was so disappointed, all he could do was go fishing. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, the way I taught it, hey, it's not bad to go fishing. That beats going, going doing something else that's a great sin, amen? He was like, man, what in the world? Our, our Messiah, our Savior, the one that we was following, the, the, the teacher, he, he wasn't all he was supposed to be. He died. So he goes fishing. Here in John chapter 20, we find them still uh, confused and still uh, maybe uh, unenamored or, 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 or doubting. But then the report comes back that there is an empty tomb. That the, the tomb, the grave uh, stone had been moved and Jesus was no longer there. So they, they ran, the Bible says they ran to that tomb. And of course, I, I lie, I'm, of course I'm, I'm being funny, but one outran the other. I think it's just funny because we, I can imagine a grown men, you know, the excitement in their, in their uh, demeanor. And, and they're like, they're not, maybe one of them was younger than the other, but man, they were booking it, trying to get there. And one of them won. And, and he walked in and he looked and there was, there was nothing there. The Savior, the Jesus that they knew was gone. But it was in that moment. In that very moment of time that things began to make sense. Things began to be clear. Things, but hey, something happened in the, in the inter intervening timeline of their running and they're coming to that empty tomb that they realized that Jesus Christ wasn't just born to die, but he was born to rise again. He was raised up for our glory and his glory so that we might live again. Hallelujah. It was better than they expected. It was, and, that, and what a great opportunity to understand something. They had gone through the cruci crucifixion and was obviously very disappointed. They had gone through the trial and was very disappointed. They had waited for three days in disappointment. But when they realized who Jesus really was in that empty tomb, their disappointment changed into one of glory and expectation and promise. Hey, everything in their mind began to change. They began to shout and dance and worship the things of their lives that it did not make any sense. And all of a sudden made every bit of sense. All of it made sense. When they came to that empty tomb, they were no longer disappointed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54 through 58. It's a lengthy reading. I'm going to read it because it's so good. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
church we have a victory in Jesus and if we don't understand it we don't get we can't comprehend it we're missing out on the greatest gift of life I didn't understand it I was I'm just giving a quick testimony I won't get into details I didn't understand it I saw my grandparents shout and worship I saw my grandparents dedicate their lives to the Lord my parents I saw them go day in and day out, living, living, quote unquote, some of us don't understand what I'm talking about, quote unquote, living for God. You're wondering, what's the big deal? I'm just going through the motions. I don't understand everything. I don't, I don't get it all. And none of that moved me because at 14, 15 years old, I eased out of the church. Y'all know some of that and how that goes. Kind of eased out of the church, start, we call it backsliding in the, in the Bible. I, mean, I don't know how you can imagine you know, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> doing, this, doing the backsliding thing, you know. Getting out of, I'm getting out of the church. Moving the church. Giving the church. But oh, I come to a place where there was a grave in my life. There was a place in my life that I, 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 I couldn't help myself. I was dead. I was dead in sin. I was dead to myself. And I'm, unfortunately, I was dead to many people. But there was in that grave a resurrected Savior that he was just standing there with his arms open wide waiting for me to come to the realization, to come to understanding of who he was, right. who he is. Right. Thanks. Amen. That scripture means so much to me. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know that our labor is not in vain. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, which gives us the greatest victory known to man. The greatest victory man can accomplish is not through winning a war. It's not through uh, uh, building a monument to ourselves. The greatest victory known unto man is not just having children and letting them be a little heritage, but the greatest victory known to man is when we come to a realization that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He laid his life upon a cross willingly. He, hey, and the most momentous point was when he said, it is finished. He wasn't saying that day is finished. He wasn't saying this trial is finished. But he said the price he had to pay to accomplish our salvation was done. Church, we are missing the greatest, the most important event of our lives if we don't come to the conclusion, the understanding that Jesus died for our sins. And we have within our ability the power, the choice to do great and mighty things through him. Hallelujah. They didn't understand. They couldn't comprehend until they come to that place, that place of death, that tomb. That is the way we are. That is the way we are. I could go through this room. I'm, I mentioned this morning, uh, uh, Sister Hillary uh, over here, Maldonado. She, of course, uh, married, been here for a long time now, but she's come to the realization, and I'm not being, I'm not trying to be, uh, anything, uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I rem I've heard the story how she was, she was dead. Not, I'm not, okay, I'm not, I'm not saying she had, a, she had a life full of death. All she thought of was death. Her mind was on death. In fact, she wanted to give up a lot. She, was, she had that mind, but yet she come to a point, and I don't know all the details, but she come to a point like several other people in this church that realized, listen, if I don't give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if I don't begin to live for Him, I'm going to die and go to a sinner's hell. I, in church, it is not God's plan for you to suffer in this life, to go through hell on earth, and then go to hell again. It is God's plan that you be resurrected from the grave of this world and to live a life that is full of joy and hope and peace and accomplishment in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 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 These apostles, disciples, just like many of us, couldn't understand it. So after the crucifixion, they realized the importance of what was going on. One day I pray, I truly do, I pray that every individual in here will have, and I believe you will. In fact, I'm, I'm, I just said that off the cuff, but let me tell you something. Everybody in here will have the opportunity to come to that place of deciding if they're going to be born again or not. 
Everyone here will have the opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to live for God. I'm going to give him my life. I'm going to please him in everything I do. Everybody here will have that opportunity. In fact, I will say that everybody in this building has had that opportunity today. You need, you need to know whatever you are expecting from God, it is better than what you expect. Whatever you think of living for God means, I'm telling you, it's better than you can expect. You will go home shortly. I'm coming to a close. You will go home shortly. You will leave this place just like Peter and John. You will leave and either you will live your life as if the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything or you will live your life as if it never happened. Your choice upon this day is simple. Yes, I went to church for years because I had to. Let me give you something real quickly. Just a thought. Lord put this in my mind earlier today and I, did, I put a, took a picture of it and set it aside. I think it's important. I do a marriage counseling at times. I do counseling for marriage. And there are five mindsets to marriage. Five mindsets. Those of you that are married or want to get married, it's very important. How you see your marriage matters to your marriage. If you, if you, there, okay, so how you see your marriage. Let me, let me go ahead, I'm, I'm winging it, so bear with me. There is the reluctant mindset. Well, I'll, I'll get married, but I'm really kind of doubtful. That's the lowest form of commitment, reluctant. There's restless mindset. Well, I'll get married until something else comes along. There's the romantic mindset. I'll get married as long as I'm treated right and I get roses on Thursdays. There's the rational mindset. It says, well, I'll get married because really it's the normal thing everybody does and I guess it's just something I need to do. The fifth one is the most important and the best one. It's called the resolute mindset. I'm going to get married. I'm going to stay married. She can lose her mind. I'm going to still be married to her. She can go crazy. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus has a resolute mindset. He says, I love you. How many of us have walked away because we're disappointed? We go fishing. We go somewhere else. We go do our thing. Ain't got time for this. This is disappointing. We get this romantic mindset. Oh, God, help us. I see this in saints. <laughs> I see this in people that try to live for God. Well, as long as the chairs are comfortable and the music's my style and the air is on, I'll live for God. We saw this fleshing out, this, this winnowing of the between the wheat and the shaft. We saw it during COVID. We saw this happening. We're seeing it happen on a daily basis. This separation of those who are resolute and those that are these other things. Well, I guess I'll live for God as long as somebody says hi to me, as long as I got friends. I guess I'll live for God as everybody else is doing it. I might as well. I want to live for God because he died for me. It's a pretty interesting reason why I said they brought this up. You know the marriages that are, that are better, the best marriages? I know I'm talking to, I'm sorry for those that are not married. I'm sorry, you're missing out by the way. I love it. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I don't know where I'd be if I wasn't married, but that has nothing to do with this. But my point is this. You know the, you know the, the neat thing about marriage? That resolute mindset are the happiest marriages. That's the, the happiest marriages are those that, you know what? I'm married, and I'm going to stay married, whether you like it or not. You can be mad at me. I don't care. I'm staying married. Those are the happiest marriages. They're the ones that last. I know I'm a little off topic. I know I am. I understand. But I believe the Lord wants us to re recognize in, in ourselves. If 
if you want a life that's better than expected, you have to make up your mind, I'm going to live for God. Not the CEO stuff. You know what CEO is? Christmas and Easter only, come to church. Yeah. There's another acronym for those that, oh, I'm out of gas and I need a blessing. God, I'm coming to church. I forgot what it's called. It's like spit or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I made that up. I don't know what it means. <laughs> the resurrection ended up being better than anybody expected. And I have found <laughs> living for the Lord is so much better than I expected. I remember, I remember my wife, I was not in church, 23 years old, 23 years of age, ignorant as the day, ignorant, I did say that right, ignorant, ignorant as the day is long, dumb as sticks, couldn't, but it was my only opportunity, it was, it was like, God, I don't know what else to do, I come into the church, and I began to live for God, and I knew that that was my only hope. Today, I'm, I'm, in a way, I, I guess, I guess in a way, I thought it might be a drudgery to live for God. I don't know why I thought that. Don't ask me why. I don't know. I thought I would, maybe just going through the motions would get, get me through it and I'd get by in life. I don't know if that's, but when I made up my mind to live for God. Everything since then has been better than I ever expected. I have not been disappointed in it. I have not, oh man, I have not been disappointed in just making up my mind only for God. This church is full of people, and I'm not here to convince you of the resurrection of Jesus, but I am going to try my best to help you to understand the importance of living for God missing out if you don't. If you don't make God your top priority, doing His will and work and serving Him, if you don't make it to give Him glory, if your life is all about you or just for the moment, I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I would get on my knees and beg you if it would change anything. I can't convince you, but I pray to God that you would see the opportunity before you. The Lord Jesus Christ out on a cross took all that punishment went to a grave but he rose again so that you can have a new life I want us to stand for a moment Easter is about a new life not restoring what was talked to some talked to a gentleman yesterday he's there in this building I'm not going to call names to a gentleman yesterday we talked about new opportunity new new doors new opportunities new lives my wife the other day she said she 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 said this I'm, I'm saying it but she said it I'm just repeating she said when 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 I was praying for God to change my husband I just thought it, I mean I, I would just be glad if he sat on a pew she got more than she expected. I didn't know what I was doing. Jeremiah reminds me, Jeremiah reminds us all that God has a plan. Jeremiah 29 and 11, of course there's much more to it than this. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken I will hear you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search with search for me with all of your heart so I'm going to close and I'm going to ask us I know our children are excited I'm excited for them I want us to take a moment though before we do anything else they don't the children don't understand the, the importance of this moment if you're in this house today been struggling, you've been doubting, you, you, you've maybe lost perspective of, of life or what's going on in your life, I, I encourage you to come to that place, that place of understanding, when you wake up to the reason that the 
death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, can you, can, it can give you new life. It can reinvigorate you. I've seen people that live for God and they kind of faded and then they come back into church and it's like, oh, you get, a, get an understanding. And they began to refocus and they become greater than they've ever been because, because they realized that moment of time, it was just, this is it. I'm resolute. I'm going to make up my mind. So as they play and they sing, I'm going to invite everyone here. If you, if you want to come, you can. Uh, I might pass through the crowd and pray for you. But I want us to just, just in our own ways, somehow, somehow recommit our lives to the Lord. He, He will give you better than you expect. He will help you more than you expect. He will carry you farther than you expect. But you have got to make up your mind. Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do your work. I'm going to do your will. I'm going to serve you. Right now, can we begin to pray? And everybody in this building, I, I encourage you to come to a place. Come on, it, it, it's, it's not me. It's not, it's not this environment. It is your choice, your choice, your, your decision. Lord, I've made up my mind. I'm going, to, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do your work. I'm going to come back to you. Come on, this altar is open for anyone that wants to come back and start over. He loves you. He has not, he has not forgotten you. He is, he is resolute in his love for you. He has made up his mind to love you. It's not him that has the choice today. It is you. God, help us. God, help us. God, reach us. Reach into the heart and the mind of your people. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, there's some people making a new commitment this morning. There's some folks here that are that are reconnecting, getting back to their roots, getting back to where they need to be. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, for, for my life, for my for my children, for this, this church, for the people in this building. I pray, Lord God, for our loved ones that are here today. Well, God, they might have come just for Easter. Let them come just to see an empty grave. But let them come with understanding to see that you can give new life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, give me a new mind, a new heart.